Okay, my name is uh, Paul Walker. I'm the Associate Dean Research in the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning here at the University of Melbourne. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Joss Boys, uh, who works at the Bartlett School of Architecture at University College London in uh, the UK. Originally trained in architecture, she was a co-founder of Matrix uh, Feminist Architecture and Research Collective in the 1980s and is one of the authors of Making Space, Women in the Man-Made Man Environment, published in 1984. Since that time, she has worked as a journalist, researcher, consultant, educator and photographer, and has published several books. Most recently, she co-founded the Disordinary Architecture Project, bringing disabled artists into architectural education, and practice to critically and creatively rethink access and inclusion. Joss explores how everyday social, uh, spatial and material uh, practices come to frame what is normal and ordinary. She works with others on design interventions that question our assumptions about who uh, gets valued and who doesn't in society, in the design of built space and in architecture as a discipline. She is the author of Doing Disability, Doing Disability Differently, uh, an alternative handbook on architecture, disability and designing for everyday life, published by Routledge in 2014. And she's the editor of Disability, Space and Architecture, a reader, published by Routledge in 2017. Please welcome Joss Boys. Um, uh, welcome. Thank you very much for having me here. It's really, it's very interesting being kind of the last talk like this in a two-day session because I've learnt so much today and I think there are lots of things that resonate in what I'm going to talk about and then there are things where it goes off a bit sideways, but maybe that's a good thing to happen. Um, I'm talking about, I use this expression, unruly bodies. Uh, this is an expression from disability studies, unruly bodies, non-compliant bodies, non-normative bodies. And I think what everybody in the room shares is that sense that we're all deeply interested in what sorts of bodies count. Again, in, in um, uh, disability studies, you might use the expression body minds. What kinds of body minds count in what situations? Who gets to be valued and who doesn't? How does space have implications in that, but also our practices? How do architectural practices and the discipline, how is it set up to make it easy to be a certain sort of body and not another one? So rather than talk about women or men or gender or sexuality, I'm really interested in this notion that it's relational. We have these ways of being, we have a real diversity of ways of being in the world, but then we have environments and... Um, practices that make it work for some people and not others. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And that's really very much about um, getting in under some quite big things within how architecture works. So for me, some of the questions we've begun to ask is, why do we use orthogra orthographic drawing techniques? What's that about? Where does that come from and why are we still doing it? Why do we use um, ergonomic drawings without taking notice of their link to eugenics in their early development. Why do we do the things that we do, let alone how our practices are organised in terms of professional ways of working? So, for me, this is a kind of... This is an unruly body. Here is somebody who uh, the built environment disables. She needs to sit down a lot. She can't, but she's hacked that existing built environment, that, that uh, bike rack for those very energetic people who cycle around and run the rest of us over, she's reusing that um, for her own needs. So for me, that's the kind of thing that I'm really interested in, and both how fantastic that is, and why we as architects let that happen, or our clients let that happen. Why she doesn't have somewhere proper to sit when she needs it in public. Um, I originally was going to do a kind of chronology, a kind of life and times in Matrix, and then leap ahead and life and times in the Disordinary Architecture Project, but I had decided, perhaps foolishly, 
to do it in a more integrated way. And I'm going to draw out some key themes which have similarities and differences, kind of alignments and tensions in those two different periods of different types of activism. Um, so, just for people who don't know, Matrix was a, a feminist design cooperative that ran for about 10 years through the 1980s um, and uh, based in London uh, and did a lot of building work but did a lot of other things. The Disordinary Architecture Project, which probably not many of you know about, has also been running for 10 years, but over the last 10 years. Disordinary Architecture Project, how do you deal with the issue that disability... Uh, and uh, or, or a whole attitude about disability is kind of an invisible presence mainly in architecture as a discipline and in terms of the profession. I know, because people come and tell me all the time, there are actually a lot of people with impairments working in architecture and being architectural students. They just don't tell anybody because they know it's going to affect their likelihood of employment and their likelihood of being allowed to study in an ordinary way. So that's pretty interesting. And the reason we started working with disabled artists is that it was a way of enabling a very creative disabled presence into architecture, which would then perhaps open up these other opportunities. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about that. What I'm going to start with, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, motivation. My motivation for all this work has been... Um, Never quite feeling that I fit in. I'm sure that's a feeling that a lot of people have here. Maybe that's how a lot of us have come into things about thinking about things like gender. Um, this is a quote from uh, a British feminist in the 1970s called Sheila Robottom, who was very um, influential there, that she said that her experience of the world was like lumbering around ungainly-like in borrowed concepts which did not fit the shape we feel ourselves to be. So for me, that was a really powerful quote about my experience at architecture school, which was not bad, but it was... I couldn't quite, I couldn't quite work was going on. This kind of inculcation of a particular way of being an architect just didn't work for me. I don't know why. I still don't know why, but it didn't. And that's led... Um, that feeling is still something that's very important to me. It's why I'm so interested in all sorts of ways about who comes to count and why they count who gets valued and who doesn't, what bodies matter. So this is a quote from a very brilliant disability studies um, scholarship scholar called Rosemary Garland Thompson, where uh, a misfit occurs only when world fails flesh in the environment one encounters. I'll talk a little bit more about misfitting, but for me that's a really interesting thing because that begins to make it a really relational issue. We fit in certain places and not in others. So it has spatial, it has architectural implications. I'm going to, I've got four themes. We'll see how they go. The last one's really all over the place, but we'll find out when we get there what you think, and maybe we can turn that into more of a conversation. So these are themes that have grown out of the Disordinary Architecture Project, really. One is, how do we go beyond stereotypes? The stereotypes of a disabled person, I would say... I'm not trying to make it like, oh, here's another identity we've not taken enough notice of. But in terms of thinking about bodies of the totality, what, what is it around being disabled that puts you in such a negative place by able-bodied people? What's going on in that process? Those attitudes have not shifted very much, I would say. So the kind of stereotypes about different sorts of bodies seem to me to be very valuable and our ability to, to understand them and our ability to develop alternative concepts and languages and, and narratives, absolutely vital. Um, the term racism, I think, actually did get, was used, first of all, at the turn of the century, but the word sexism only got going in the 1960s. So when we started doing uh, work around gender and space, it relates very much to some of the things that Sharon has said and other people have said. When we started doing work around it, that idea that space was neutral, that there was no notion of gender, you didn't have a word like sexism to even describe it. All our original our initial work in the late 70s, early 80s was just trying to work out what the fuck was going on, what we could say even. So these kinds of uh, images of, and again it's all around the middle class white housewife, but these kinds of images of women who were taking over, those women were taking over the roles of servants 
And it was the labour-saving devices that was making that kind of an acceptable thing to happen. Um, so these were the kind of images that were being used. These were the kind of uh, design guidance that you got in an architect's practice in the 1970s in England. Um, space in the home, housing layout, introduction to housing layout, housing the family. Here we have a kind of absolute, like the nuclear family, as the model. Uh, you can see the woman, she's really, she's pretty well chained to the kitchen sink through all of that. And the, and the one, there's a, there's a wonderful one for the second half of the day, which I haven't shown here, where there's a beautiful, the, the man comes home from work, because um, he's not in, well, maybe he's, oh, he's up there washing his face. Um, he comes into work, he comes in from work, he sits down in front of the telly, the little drawing of the telly, and she's in the back doing the food and doing the um, washing up. So it's a kind of, but it was offered up as uh, a neutral, perfect model, really, at a time when, in fact, family household organisation was, was shifting really enormously. Um, people like me, a younger generation of women, mainly white middle class women, were coming into higher education in increasingly larger numbers. And it was like an attempt, almost, uh, to try and keep things in this kind of nice, neat, suburban order. So that's what we were given. This is um, Introduction to Housing Layout. And when I, it says at the bottom, it says to us, come in, this might lead somewhere, there might be an exit. Oh, doesn't that look an interesting little corner to go around? And every woman in this room will think, fuck, that looks really scary. <laughs> so there's a kind of mismatch between these assumptions, and these are given as kind of neutral. You know, this is like, this is the way it is. This is, this is the way the world works. So we were trying to unpick some of that and those stereotypes, and the book was one of the ways that we tried to do it. And I think this does sum up what Matrix was trying to do. The authors of this book belong to a group of feminist designers called Matrix. We are women who share a concern about the ways buildings and cities work for women, our training and our work for Matrix has helped us to look critically at our built surroundings. We want to share these skills with others to help us all develop an understanding of how we are placed as women in the man-made environment and to use that knowledge to subvert it. I love that last line. And I also love this line, which I think, I don't know who, I think it was Beatrix Campbell, a stiff challenge to the great macho myths of metropolitan architecture. Yay. Um, and Matrix did... So one of the things that Matrix was interested in, in terms of challenging those stereotypes, was how the built environment did actually disable women in particular ways, in terms of the roles, the gender roles they already had. Um, it shifted, uh, it looked for new ways of doing a participatory design method that would enable the uh, working class, the black, the lesbian clients that they had, understand what the spaces were like that they were designing. And a lot of that was done through model making. Um, there were a lot of uh, pamphlets and leaflets, which, you know, have nothing like the quality of parlour, but tended to be doing on things called um, Ronios, what were they called? Yes, you know, things that most... Yes, we, <laughs> the people who know do that, and everybody else will knows what it means. Um, and a real connection to building and the building trade. So this is uh, Susan Francis and Mary Lou Ascott, who were both in Matrix and uh, also worked, uh, trained as carpenters and joiners. So there's a real sense of trying to shift all the different ways in which uh, um, stereotypes within the profession were kind of fixed around uh, particular notions of gender. So it worked across several levels. So how does that connect to what I do now? So these are some, this is one of the artists that I work with here on the right-hand side, Naomi Lackmeyer. And this is a project we did recently in uh, Copenhagen. We're really interested in finding new languages for thinking about those stereotypes. Uh, uh, and not just really breaking beyond binaries or even binary oppositions, but thinking about a whole new way of talking about it. Because if you still talk about disabled people and able-bodied people, you're, it's really, the categories are really embedded. People always ask me about the artists. They don't ask what their creative practice are. They say, oh, what's there? What's wrong with them then? So there's a kind of notion, and, and when you, I'm sure you've all had this experience, you know, people get put in the category of blind or deaf, uh, wheelchair users, and then it's assumed that they're all pretty well the same. 
and that their lives go on the same and that those things are stable categories. And we're really interested in how they're very unstable categories, very fluid categories, and we need to think about it in a different way. The mission statement of the Disordinary Architecture Project is to promote activity that develops and captures models of new practice for the built environment led by the creativity and experiences of disabled artists. And I say, as I say, that's been about experiments and provocations. It's not to say we are actually looking at how to get more disabled people into the profession as creatives and not just as clients or users, but it's also about really shifting the kind of assumptions and the techniques that we use within uh, the discipline. So <clears throat> I'm going to quote from myself. <laughs> Always a bit embarrassing, but it is... Um, I'm going to hammer on about this a bit because for me, uh, I can talk a little bit about at some stage about why I got involved in disability, but for me, it was around this notion of misfitting. It was like this huge secret in architecture, just like nobody talks about it. Um, so disability sits in a peculiar position with architecture whilst readers and anthologies already exist around gender, around race, around sexuality. Um, Disability as a concept and disabled people as a constituency continue to be assumed as completely separate from social or cultural politics. It seems that we assume disability to be unable to bring any criticality or creativity to the discipline of architecture. So let's think about what that criticality or what that creativity is and link that through to ideas about feminism, about gender. Um, Categorization. The categorization of disabled people is incredibly, it's functional, it's technical, it changes through time. But, you know, if any of you have ever done designs using the building regulations of whatever country you come from, that will be as if they're just, you know, a wheelchair user is a wheelchair user. Uh, actually, quite often, they're just called a wheelchair. They don't even exist. Um, so these kind of categories and the ways these categories of shifts are always done in this kind of very this attempt to really bundle people into particular groupings. And it's time we stop that. And what we do is, as I just said, this is what we do. This is the thing that links disabled people to the practice of architecture. It's madness. Why do we still do it? We do it because it's the regulations. We do it because, you know, we don't know much about that subject, so we have these little toilet templates and we just dump them in and then we make them a bit smaller because there's no room in this, you know, there's not enough space. Um, and they are, uh, they perpetuate a particular thing that doesn't get thought about. So just as in terms of thinking about times when women don't count or women get assumed to act in a particular way, we're doing it all the time. We're all implicated in what, what, what bodies come to count and what don't. Uh, and this is where we start. So we start from the creativity of disabled artists. This is, um, you'll see them in some other slides, Aaron Williamson, who's a deaf artist. This is Catherine Aranello, who unfortunately died last year. Uh, they have this whole thing going, they had this whole thing going called the Disab Disabled Avant-Garde Today. And the whole point, of the which is a whole series of little videos on YouTube which you can watch, uh, and they use kind of burlesque and crip humour. They use the kind of humour that comes out of the freak show um, to basically play on that line, which is if you're disabled, there's no way you could be avant-garde. So from our point of view, we're really interested in this thing that, you know, within architecture schools, within practice, could we make disability, doing stuff around disability, like so cool that everybody really wanted to do it? And as, yes, exactly, and the, the, the energy and enthusiasm for that is there, but the mechanisms to make it happen are still not really. Um, and part of that problem, I'm going to go back to this thing about which bodies count and how they count, and I suppose it's because I am really interested, a lot of the stuff that we do starts from thinking about each of us as having embodied creative and professional practices. We bring ourselves to it, talking to a group here, Obviously, that's something we think about quite a lot, but how we think about it and how it operates differentially, perhaps we don't... Um, we, make, we, we, just, we, we assume certain things, and I would include myself in that, or include all of us in that. Um, there are people who do not 
So we, we kind of have an everyday, we kind of have an everyday understanding about what's okay. So this is okay, weirdly. You all know the rules and I know the rules. You have, I, I stand up when I talk and you all sit in these kind of very neat rows on chairs that if you have back problems are actually quite uncomfortable. There are no other ways to sit if you're uh, deaf and you sign. Actually signing in a row is really hard. You have to kind of turn. So it's a very, uh, it sets a certain set of things about what the everyday is. What's, and if I stood on a chair, you'd probably allow it because it's me. But if one of you stood on a chair, or if you're autistic and you're stimming, you're kind of jiggling around, then it's not acceptable. So we actually make lots of judgments about everyday social, spatial and material practices that we don't necessarily really critically engage with. Um, and it came up earlier, and I think it's really important. The thing about thinking about disability is you have to talk about ability at the same time. What are the rules about what counts as the kind of proper body to have? Um, and how do those, how do they set up anxieties and differences for different people? And I do this exercise a lot. Uh, I won't do the exercise, but we do it a lot with um, architecture students where we ask people to talk about what is it you need to be to be an architect? What is the kind of rules of the game? And we've talked about it, it came up earlier. It's about being obsessive. It's about those very high work cultures, but it's also about being very fit and entrepreneurial and up for it and um, expressing your talent in particular ways. So there are certain understandings about what counts as competence, which may not, if you have an impairment, they may not show themselves in the same way. And if you have a certain assumptions about what counts as competence, then that doesn't really help. Um, so uh, here's somebody trying very hard to be fit, to, to do the model. Um, and to me, he looks pretty, it's kind of like, it's quite, it's, he's feeling quite anxious about that. He's kind of, he's giving himself away, really. Uh, and then this is something you may know about. It's called the privilege game. Has anybody ever done the privilege game or heard of the privilege game? It, it, yeah, great. Yeah. It, uh, I've never done it with students, which is one of the things. This company, it's, it's kind of from the States often. But it's about recognising that there's how we act as individuals and how we do or don't perpetuate norms and normative ways of working. But that's also societal, of course. So the privilege game is basically where you stand everybody in a line at the beginning and then you ask them questions. Uh, are you the child of a single parent? Two steps back. Uh, did you go to a posh school? Four steps forward. Um, uh, are you a person of colour or uh, from an indigenous background? Four steps back. So you end up with everybody being sp <laughs> spread out in a very uh, revealing way. It's like a visualisation of how societal um, structures affect people differently. Uh, and, and again, I would say... We all have to think about that. We all have to think about the implications for that in our own lives, in our own assumptions about the world. Everybody in this room, I would say, if you're in this room, you have some privilege. You wouldn't be in this room if you didn't. You've got somewhere. So how do we talk about that in the Disordinary Architect Project and with students and with uh, practitioners? Rather than using notions of disabled bodies or able-bodied, Again, it comes back to this thing about fit. So it's relational. In what circumstances do you fit and why, and why don't you in others? So we have the notion of misfit and misfitting as a way of expressing difference and then looking at where that difference becomes differential. But we also treat that as a... Um, we deliberately flip it over because one of the things I think that's true is you certainly take more notice of things if you don't fit. So if you fit, if your life, and I, people will have different experiences in this room, but if basically your life has been relatively smooth, you've, you've, uh, you've been materially all right, you've uh, found it easy to just slip into architecture school or some other educational setting or some practice setting, maybe with some hiccups, but generally smooth. Um, from the point of view of disordinary, that's a problem because what it means is you really are not developing skills in taking notice of and uh, of your surroundings in their wider sense, social, spatial, material, 
and you're just unproblematically in the world. So you don't necessarily have any techniques for thinking about people who uh, have very different ways of being in the world. Whereas if you misfit and you have a non-normative body-mind, then whether you want to or not, you have to pay a huge amount of attention to what's going on. One of the things we always say about the disabled people that we work with is they're very creative. They are actually the experts in using the built environment because they are absolutely negotiating it at every minute of the day. They can't just jump around kind of um, from place to place without even thinking about it. Uh, they're, they're on the case all the time. So that's the kind of, it's like we're really trying to shift the language uh, in a way that allows us just to think about this differently and in a way that makes it more emergent and open-ended and not just closed down around binary oppositions and particular categorizations. The second theme is that actually if you start with the outliers, when we design, we tend to design for a kind of every person, a user, uh, they're a kind of, I don't know who they are really, they're kind of a bit amorphous. Maybe if we design from the outliers, from the non-normal bodies, from the unruly bodies, we might find out some really interesting and creative things. Um, in terms of how that operated with Matrix, that was very much around working with people who would not normally have access to architecture, to, to being in control of a building, to being a client for a building. So this is Anne Thorne, one of the architects with Matrix, and the client for Jaganari Asian Women's Centre, uh, Salma Agmeg, talking, and there's a brilliant TV program called Paradise Circus, where they have this absolutely hilarious conversation where Selma kept saying, they were very reputable, you know, they were very reputable architectural practice. Um, but you, uh, uh, it was a very direct thing. It was opening up resources to people who didn't normally have them. Here's some pictures from Jaganari. Uh, and here's the front of that building, still there. Um, I think, and there's lots of reasons why, you know, at a later date, uh, we've come to this slightly differently. It's also, I think, partly to do with what you can do around, how you have to operate dis differently around disability. Um, architects practice the kind of more radical practice, I don't know, like Muff, who you may know of, or Taking Place, has, has tended to move more into a kind of creative art-related practice anyway, and I think we've learned quite a lot from that. This is Naomi Lapmeyer again, one of the artists who's very involved. Uh, this is, <laughs> you still can't see his face, but this is Aaron Williamson in a different mode. This is a project called Demonstrating the World, uh, which I won't talk about. This is Dave Dixon. Uh, this is another project we did in Copenhagen, which was about how you might think about difference as a powerful generator, not as either something better or worse. So it comes from him either being considered a cyborg, he's got, a, he's got an aesthetic, a prosthetic leg, he must be really cool and robotic, or uh, people really feel sorry for him, feeling that it's, you know, he needs to be pitied. And he's used it as part of his art practice to think through how, uh, in this case, this was about drawing differently. If you changed the shape of your body and you drew differently, what did you learn from that? Um, and I, I really love this one because one group, it was done very quickly. One group just invented these kind of binoculars, which has, uh, the, as you can see, the charcoal in one and has just a hole in the other. So you can see with one eye, but you can't see, I can't do this with these two things. You can't see, um, you can't see what you're actually drawing until after you've drawn it. So it's just an experiment in different ways of drawing. It's, very, it's foundational work. It's some of the foundational projects we do with students. This is Liz Crow. Um, she's uh, a really interesting artist. who has been a very long time and uh, is, has a chronic condition that means that she needs to lie down a lot and that in those... Uh, she's often treated as if she's homeless or drunk or she's moved on. Lying down in public turns out to be quite problematic. Um, who knew? Uh, and she does work, she's done work with, our student, with students on something called Tilted Horizon, so about how you might find places to lie down, but also what happens when you look at the world from a completely different angle and what you might learn from that. That's a project done by some students. Uh, this is Raquel Merzagoué, who does something similar. She, hers is called a crash course in cloud spotting. She came to 
Copenhagen as well, and they just did a little bed with a view. So um, that notion of rest, of resting spaces, and how you know the building regulations don't cover that at all, um, and yet it's such a key thing for so many different people, uh, and, and it blurs across ability and disability. This is a project, I just wanted to mention a project by other people, because it's definitely not just us. Uh, this is a project by um, Sophie Handler, which she did with a group of um, pensioners with old people in East London, which links back to my photograph of the woman sitting on the uh, bike rack, which was about where they do find places to sit down. And, and then designing something that would make that both a more performative experience but also a more comfortable experience. So this is somebody with their cushion because they sit on a bollard very regularly. Not comfortable, so this is how you make it comfortable. This is Sarah Hendren um, designing uh, very simple ramps that bring together people, anybody who uses a wheeled vehicle, whether it's a skateboard or a wheelchair. And this is a project they did in Toronto where they just looked at where you could put those ramps very quickly and make that whole street much more accessible. Um, this is somebody who's truly wonderful, called Amy Hamray. She's got a whole series of really interesting projects going on at the University of Vanderbilt that are exploring crowdsourcing. So she's exploring how you might get a very diverse range of knowledge and information about a built space, um, and then use that as a way of informing design. So instead of having you know, those technical guidance that tell you, here's the solution, let's just close this all down and get on to the next thing. This is about opening it up, using uh, new techniques, new uh, GIS frameworks to really build up a body of knowledge that enables architects and other kinds of designers to make good decisions. They're, not gonna, they're still not going to get it right for everybody, but it's going to be much more like other aspects of the design process, which is where you just do the best you can with partial data. Um, and that's another part of that critical design lab. So I just wanted to add one more thing to that about what we found we've just got into. Again, if we're talking about uh, thinking about difference as a creative generator, I mentioned this idea that we do, that people are just kind of placeholders. You know, we, we have these, we still use these kinds of figures. Um, they're pretty pretty similar bunch, really, except for some reason for the nun. I don't know quite where she came from. But the, the kind of, and you can see there's kind of sporty cars. You know, it's interesting, really. Uh, but they are just placeholders. So one of the things we've done is work with people who've thought about trying to draw, represent human beings in a much richer way. Uh, this is uh, Tatiana from Spain. This is uh, Greg from the University of Newcastle in the UK, looking at, he, he actually did a diploma project which was about uh, how you might queer space, but he was also really interested in how you might crip space at the same time. So he began to use these kind of figures that were based, that took a surrealist and a bit of a burlesque aspect to them to help him think through um, different ways of designing space. And then this is a project I really love by somebody called Thomas Carpentier, uh, which was his diploma project in France um, called The Measures of Man. Uh, and what he did was he took, he kind of took the whole ergonomic thing really seriously, but he started bringing in all those outlier characters, um, drew them very accurately, and then began to imagine, uh, so you can see we've got the Borg Queen, we've got Arnold Schwarzenegger. And then he imagined... Uh, what would happen if they all lived together in the same house? So there's the dining table at the bottom, and that's what it looks like. So this is an incredibly thorough bit of design. It's the most beautiful, really detailed bit of design. Uh, and then this is just one of many, many drawings of how that begins to build up into a whole space, and series of spaces, a house. So that, to me, those kinds of things, for me, those are very creative. They're, they're energizing the work that we do. They're taking what is normally seen as worthy, politically correct, but, but kind of boring uh, stuff around access and inclusion and turning it to something that's actually really exciting and innovative. That links to me to something which, is, which I think also links back to Matrix, which is about how you do challenge the normal. If I've been going on about non-normative bodies, about unruly bodies, 
we're really interested in what you can do within architecture to challenge the normative aspects of it. And in many ways, if you practice, or if you're a student in this profession, you kind of think that's what you're doing anyway, because part of what you're trying to do is always improve things, make a difference, um, change a kind of the norms of a typology that are no longer working. Um, but I would say that a lot of that nevertheless reproduces a whole lot of, of our everyday social, spatial and material practices that are actually really disadvantaging some people against others. And the social model of disability notion, which is how environments disable, I think the language of spaces that disable or enable people very easily spreads beyond just literally being disabled. It spreads to a whole range of um, misfitting and non-normative relationships to the world. So how do we challenge what's normal? It's come up previously, and I think it's still worth saying, is that's part of a much wider shift, kind of political, social, campaigning shift. Um, uh, we've talked about civil rights, the disability rights movement in the States and in the UK grew out of the civil rights movement um, and was very powerful and import important and in fact led to the kind of building regulations that we have. Uh, they were disability-led, but they got distorted in the end. Um, and those things are still going on, and they're really that kind of... The variety of ways in which we can challenge the normal and how we build on what else is going on, I think, is um, something that's come up very regularly over these two days. For me, uh, it relates to something else that's been coming up, which is how much we learn from outside our own discipline. And partly because... I learned such a lot from disability studies, and I'm learning all the time from disability scholarship, from disability arts, from disability activism. Those things just don't penetrate into architecture. I don't know why. They're so connected. Um, you just have to read my books, and then you'll see. Um, that, that we are engaged with these wider things, but uh, I think it's kind of interesting about what we take from that wider world and how we absorb it or translate it within the discipline. So for Matrix, that was absolutely what we did. There was nothing in the UK that we could find. There were some feminist geographers. They were brilliant. <laughs> it was like we, were just, we just ran to the feminist geographers because there was nothing within architecture. There was stuff, as Sharon mentioned, that was already happening in the States. And that was incredibly important to us. We, we, uh, we read those books avidly and um, uh, were just really energized by them because we just didn't have anything equivalent. Uh, but we were part of a much wider set of movements in London in particular uh, in the 1970s. So this one, I don't know if you can read it. It says, if crime doesn't pay, where do architects get all their money? Um, there was something called the Architects Revolutionary Council, which was run out of the Architectural Association. So it was run out of one of the most prodigious schools in the UK. This is Slate, um, which was a magazine run by something called the New Architecture Movement, which was um, working towards unionising um, architectural workers. Uh, and then in relationship to that, in terms of matrix, it meant there was a whole set of other things that we did around meetings and conversations and making different sorts of networks that built on that much bigger uh, situation that, and was in deeply informed by it. And similarly for me, I suppose I'm always going on about this and I know I'm, you know, if I have a problem then I find the book to read about it. I'm just one of those people and I know that that's not what a lot of people do and it's actually a little weird. But for me, I cannot believe that this fantastic stuff that's coming out of other disciplines about different sorts of bodies is not, whether that's around race or gender or disability or mixture, has not really had much impact um, within architecture. And... That brings me to another, to a kind of another notion about language. Um, we don't use the expression access and inclusion. It's very useful sometimes, but I find it really problematic because what it does, inclusion and access, they both mean I'm here, I'm fine. 
You can come and join me if you like. I'll, I'll help you do that. And then I'll feel better about myself. Really. Um, and so what we want is something which is much more about how starting from the non-normative, from the unruly bodies, we might, and the misfits, we might actually really, and looking at what bodies are ignored or valued, we might actually have to change the profession of architecture and its education quite a lot. Um, and one of the ways we do that is something called breaching. So I talked about the fact that if I stood on that chair, you'd all be like, oh, that's a bit weird, but, you know, <laughs> she's the guest speaker. We'd better be nice about it. Um, <laughs> I won't talk about that. This is how, I, I don't know why Aaron's coming up quite such a lot in these pictures, but anyway, he seems to. This is Aaron Williamson. As I mentioned, he's a deaf artist. He uh, studied his whole education, his whole fine art education. There were no accommodations made. So he would sit at the back of a lecture, and being Aaron, he'd just think it was absolutely hilarious. He'd have the lecturer, you see, <laughs> waving their arms. Um, and he'd no idea what they were saying, but he used to really enjoy it as a performance. So he's developed a kind of whole performative, he does a lot of live art, a lot of it, which is really, uh, it's just um, some of the best work I've seen, really. Um, this one's called Flannel. So he gives a lecture with something with a flannel in his mouth. Nobody says anything. He does another one, uh, which is, I can't remember what it's called, but it is basically where there's never a lecture. So, because he's got a sign language interpreter, I do. It's hard, I wave my arms around a lot. Um, uh, so he has conversations with the sign language interpreter, which are actually, they just talk about the weather and stuff, but nobody in the audience knows. And um, the whole point of it is, he's waiting to see how long people will sit there with no lecture before they leave or complain or ask. And, and mainly it's normally about 40 minutes. So that notion of breaching, of challenging the norms that we have, is a really powerful way. We do it a lot with students, um, slightly less with professionals, uh, is a way of um, opening up new spaces. This is at the, something we did very briefly at the Royal Academy. This space was a little exhibition space, and we were looking for finding a breakout space at the Royal Academy where you could go and sit... Um, you could just get away from the flow. And you could sit down, which actually is surprisingly difficult there, the Royal Academy in London. So we put a couple of chairs in and we couldn't stop people sitting in them. Um, and uh, one of the artists involved here on the left, John Adams, who's an autistic artist, uh, produced some kind of music and um, bird song. And we did a kind of consultation exercise. Uh, and... Weirdly, putting some chairs into a gallery is often a real breaching operation, because I don't know, you've probably seen all those museum benches. They're not really for sitting down on. Uh, so it uh, hopefully will lead to something. And then uh, the final example on, in this section I wanted to give is um, something called Architecture Beyond Sight, which for me is a really powerful form of breaching, and we'll see where it gets. Um, and it, it's at the Bartlett. It happened before I uh, got the job there. Uh, and it's still going on, but in a kind of separate category. And the point of... The, it was a thought experiment by the then Dean, Alan Penn, which was that he was getting very worried that architecture, as it's being taught at the Bartlett, is incredibly visual. It's not just visual in terms of how you design spaces that are very visually oriented, but it's visual in terms of students doing representations that are so complex in their drawing that unless you're actually part of the school, you've got no idea what's going on. So he'd met a blind architect. He's here in this picture, Carlos um, Pereira from Portugal. And, oh, and that's Alan over there in the red. Um, and we decided that we'd set up course, a course, uh, foundation course for blind and partially sighted people. And Disordinary Architecture got involved because we wanted that to be disability-led. So all the tutors uh, on it are blind or visually impaired people. Um, we had a blind architect from the States called Chris Downley. We had a really brilliant um, craftsman from Tasmania called Duncan Murding. And uh, we had, we've run it one time and we had 16 students, all blind or with, part, uh, with partially sighted, um, basically learning a week long course, learning to be architects. And what's been really interesting about that is 
it is about shifting design methods. Like it is, that's why it's such a brilliant thought experiment, because it's like, if you do architecture as you do architecture, all you can say is, it, well, it's very visual. You couldn't possibly do it if you don't have sight. I know, because lots of people come and tell me, that there are a huge number of people out there uh, who are architects and who are also quite severely partially sighted. They just don't tell anybody because they're really worried about what well, it's going to do his job with their job. And we talked about workloads and obsession. And the thing is, people manage that extra thing. They manage the exhaustion that having to focus on something is, uh, involves. So we've been developing a whole series of methods, everything from word pitches from audio description. Could you design a building by just describing it verbally? Uh, we do use a kind of performative method. We use very large body scale drawings. This is Rachel Gadsden, one of the artists I work with, a blind artist, uh, here doing some project work with the students. Um, this is Mandy Redvers Rowe, who's actually um, a theatre producer and writer and performer, with Shade um, Abdul, who was one of the architects involved. And they performed the space for us. They designed the space and they performed it. And we all knew exactly what it was like. Um, here's the people doing some making in the workshop. Uh, these are all, uh, that's three students, and then you can see Mandy in the middle. Uh, here's some of the work that they made. Um, and there's, that's our review of the work. And at every stage, there's always, so this is um, Liz Porter, who's a blind storyteller. So at every stage, blind people were central to making it work. And the feedback was fantastic. It was basically that it was the first properly accessible course in every way that anybody had been on. And for the school, for people who were really anxious about this, they couldn't believe how conceptually strong the work was. For us, of course, that wasn't, we never thought of that as being a problem. But they assumed these were people who were going to come in and make kind of copies of toolboxes like you do it when you're 12. So finally, this is a bit that's a bit wobbly, but I wanted to, it's some, one of the things about what we all do is what sort of work it is and how that work perpetuates or challenges everyday practices. So there is actually a lot of work in perpetuating the world in one way rather than another. The kind of policing, uh, and people, I, I mean, I'll use the disabled toilet as an example, but it's certainly something that uh, transgender people suffer all the time. You get policed if you go to the restroom, if the people think you're in the wrong one. People will most definitely, they're very proud that they stop. They walk by and they see somebody going into a disabled toilet that they don't think is disabled, and so they stop them. So there's a kind of energy put into reproducing the world in a particular way rather than another, which we all do. We may not know that we're doing it, but we do it. So. That's a kind of work, and that work can be uh, positive and progressive, or actually it can be quite conservative and containing. And like I said, I better say it again, we all have all of that in us. We're not just all fantastic. We all are doing quite complex work in perpetuating the world in some ways and not others. Um, but also... Uh, there is the work of political action, or there's the work of everyday action, of, of being an architect, of working in practice. And um, I wanted to kind of reflect on that work and how we might learn something from it. It connects really nicely, I think, to the earlier session about history. So here we all are. This is not, well, it's nothing like we all. Matrix probably had something like 60, 50 or 60 women go through it in its 10 years. Um, some less happy about that than others. And, but this is the group who's currently working on um, trying to get a matrix archive going, trying to get the book uh, republished, because it's been out of print for a long time, trying to do that thing of not letting that... Um, a bearing witness to that period. But we don't want to do that in a way, because we do get mythologised all the time. I mean, I have sat next to people who are like, you're in Matrix, and they literally can't talk to me. Or they say, oh, we thought you were dead. Um, and actually, somebody in this picture is dead, which is really, really sad. So, um, we meet, we've been meeting over the years. You know, we still, we're mates. People have gone off and done different things, but we're mates. Uh, some of the people in this picture are, were more in the book group, and some were in the design practice. 
Um, and one of the things that we've been thinking about is what an archive might be. This is a quote from Sarah Ahmed about sweaty concepts, which I think is really powerful. And it is about the fact that, I'll, re I'll read this one out, a sweaty concept might come out of a bodily experience that is trying. The task is to stay with the difficulty, to keep exploring and exposing this difficulty. Not eliminating the effort or labor becomes an aim because we have been taught to tidy up not to reveal the struggle we have in getting somewhere. So for me, that feeds very much into the earlier discussion. It is that how can we have some way of recording that history that doesn't mythologize it, that doesn't turn it into a kind of, oh, well, we, were, we did this and we did that, um, doesn't... So maybe tries to build it into the canon, but tries to use it as a way of thinking about the canon in very alternative ways. Um, so we've begun to gather, it's a nightmare, we're really struggling with this, but, because nobody has any time, but um, we've begun to gather the kind of artefacts and the ephemera that we have and think about what those objects stand for. So I really love this one. This is um, uh, the copy, this is the Bartlett School of Architecture copy of the Making Space book. Uh, and if you open it up, it's got, it's, it's got loads of people's writing in it, it's got loads of corners turned over, it's got one of those really old-fashioned things that you don't do anymore, because it's been there so long, since 1984, where you have those library stamps, and there's like 25 sheets of paper, and they're all kind of curled up. Um, so here is a kind of example of something that clearly goes on being really um, important to new generations of students. They're finding it, they're using it, and at the same time, it's like, it's still true that the school never went out and bought another one. So what's going on there? Um, this is uh, a drawing um, that uh, Julia Dwyer did of a balcony structure for uh, a Stockwell Children's Centre, I think. And she and I have been doing some work on this thing about how you might talk about archival material and see it as part of the process. So it's not representational of the activity, but it's actually part of the process. And I will read this too, I'll read bits of it. Um, because it's about work, and again, it's about how in an activist and a feminist process, there are some things you challenge and some things you so do not challenge. There are 66 hand-drawn A3 size one, one to five working drawings, which were done between March and July 1987, of balconies, staircases, railings, doors and windows, roof junctions and patent glazing. Uh, and then she works out the timing of that. Each one of these must have taken between four and eight hours, i.e. between 33 and 66 unbroken eight-hour days. Each A1 drawing took at least a day per drawing. Um, so, and her last line is, however, although Matrix challenged many of the structures and conventions of architectural practice, here the language remains set within conventional protocols. And most importantly, this building never got built. So she's really interested in... You know, it, it's it, talking about that, about how, especially I think if you're in kind of activist practice, you are also caught up in that obsessive work ethic and that we should think those things through. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about this history and how you might write those histories is, for me, Matrix was quite intersectional. It did, if you look at that original leaflet that I showed you, it says we work, we particularly look to work with black and les black uh, women and lesbians and, and that's absolutely true in terms of the work that they did and the work that we read. And we were reading stuff around disability um, in that period. There were a lot of disabled feminists writing in that period who somehow have also got lost to feminism, unfortunately. But at the same time, the reason I want to use it as an example is our goal, the focus really, was on what was called the problem of no name, the, the middle-class white housewife, how that was a really... That was the problem for women in that period, that that was kind of the only role model that was open to you. But of course, that was a role model aimed only at one specific group. It wasn't true for if you were working class, if you were a black woman. It wasn't, you know, that didn't connect to your experience. And actually, it didn't connect to my experience at all. So I felt, again, this sense of misfitting in that um, I was meant to be worried about something which didn't connect to my past. My mum was not in any way, uh, that kind of housewife. 
She had no idea. Uh, I'll maybe talk about that another time. Um, so I guess it's a kind of, it's a thought about all the things we talk about. We might be kind of in, inviting, you know, as somebody as a, as a white middle class woman, I'm inviting other people in. But if the stories I want to tell and the things that I make my focus are not those other people's stories, then actually I'm not really inviting them in. And I think that that was one, a set of contradictions that happened with, in Matrix in a way that's really interesting. It's not about telling people off or being judgmental, but that it needs to be unpicked. Um, this is Liz Crow. I mentioned her earlier. She's, she was one of those disabled feminists writing in that period. She's still making some really interesting work. And I just wanted to end, really, in uh, recognising and valuing the huge amount of work that is going on by disabled activists, artists, and um, scholars, and thinking about how much there is to learn from them and how, because they still sit outside our discipline, they don't tend to be something we hear about. Um, so there's still a huge amount of you know, disability activism, which is kind of, uh, again, architects are implicated in that. We're implicated in making disabling spaces. And I wanted to end with, um, this is Mia Mingus. Uh, they have a project, it's called the Disability Visibility Project. It's called Access is Love. And it's about the idea that access and uh, inclusion is a completely collective endeavor. Everybody's responsible for it. You don't just have to be disabled. It's something that we all share and that it's a beautiful thing. And people sharing and helping each other out in terms of being able to make use of the built environment in all the ways that they need to and want to is a very powerful thing. And that's happening to a large degree in disability activism. We don't take any notice of it. And this is a book, Dreaming Disability Justice. So within disability studies, you wouldn't talk about access and inclusion. You talk about social, material, and spatial justice. And I think that's kind of important, really. So I'm going to end on that. Um, thank you. Um, um, I think we have time for one or two questions. Any, so have we got questions? Yes. Um, thank you so much for that, love, that excellent um, uh, presentation. I've just got a question about how you navigate um, uh, people who are disabled with different or conflicting needs. So as an example, um, I design a lot of play spaces and I've had a scenario in the past where there's a group of parents that have children that are autistic and a group of parents that have children that have physical disabilities. And the design outcome for those two different groups of people is quite different. Um, how do you go about determining what is included and what isn't? Thank you. That's actually a really uh, great question because it connects to something that I just forgot to say. So for me, the trouble is that disability is still put in this, you're not doing this, but disability is put in this kind of, oh, disabled person problem, category problem, blind, wheelchair, deaf, autistic, needs a solution. What's the solution? Tell us the solution. Sorted. And I get asked that all the time. What am I going to do? I've got to decide an autistic school. What's the answer? Ask the dull people. Ask the autistic students. So one of the things that we're always banging on about is... We're looking at, I think one of the reasons for going across disability and across other kind of quote unquote identities is you're always looking for alignments and allegiances and uh, where things do really work together, which they often do. And then you accept that there are lots of tensions and contradictions and that there will always be things that don't fit. So you're never going to get it right. And, and your example, I think, is a very good one. There will be things where it might, there might be overlaps but then there are things that are, um, uh, and there's a lot, I mean, you know, you can, you can keep it within one category, if we do use categories. The, the accessible toilet, 
the range of ways in which people use wheelchairs, we're not even talking about other reasons people use a disabled toilet. If you use a wheelchair, the range of ways that you use it, or a mobility scooter, there is no one toilet that actually works. You know, what we need really is, we need a generosity, we need more different, we need variety. But I think the... We need to move to a culture where it's all right to do the best that you can, just like or every other design problem. It's like, why is this a particular design problem where somehow we've got to get it on the nail when we don't, you know, there's lots of things about this room that don't suit lots of people in this room, but we, we kind of manage. So that would be my, it's, it's a bigger thing about, treat, if you treat it as something that's a generator, then you're just treating it like every other partial variable that you use in design. And you're not getting caught up about, oh no, I might have made some terrible mistake. Okay. You need that. Um, I think what we should do is thank Joss Boys very much for a fantastic talk. <laughs> <laughs>